Thank you very much, Mr. Dawes. Um, and my congratulations to Russell Hancock and the team that has organized this conference. I've had the opportunity to participate and observe it over the years, and it's a, it's a great, great conference to all of the assembled public officials and business leaders, investors, civic officials, nonprofit leaders, and friends of Silicon Valley all. Thank you for allowing me to be part of today's activities. This has been a great week in the South Bay, starting with the Super Bowl on Sunday. I have uh, been around for a long time. I was mayor of San Antonio in the 1980s, secretary of HUD in the 90s. But it was a great week when Peyton Manning made it okay to be the old guy and win. <laughs> Congratulations on your participation in this 2016 State of the Valley Conference, and more importantly, on being contributors, each in your own way, to this regional phenomena, which is the envy of the world. You are participants in a global economic and innovation juggernaut, which is recognized and admired across the world. You're at the creative center of the most apl uh, creative applications of technology. You're reconfiguring cultural and social patterns. You're touching lives wherever human beings live, their health, learning, entertainment, connectedness, productivity, communications, decision-making, finances, and mobility. You're generating incomes and wealth, driving prosperity and new fortunes. And you're creating an unprecedentedly complex, interwoven physical place in this network of cities, counties, in this region. You're also not dealing with some basic urban realities, those which must be addressed to keep Silicon Valley livable, functional, and prosperous for a sustained period of time. For one, you have a serious housing problem. And where people are involved, where a workforce is involved, where one of the most basic functions of a human community is involved, where and how do people live to fail in that arena is a serious problem. Remember this, home is where a job goes to live. And homes are interwoven with other basic quality of life realities like transportation and traffic, like public education, like the essential infrastructure of water and power and public spaces and social institutions, and like loftier concepts such as inclusion and equity. Across the years of American history, there have been places that were the center of the economic universe in their time. And they, too, were responsible for nation-shifting dimensions. For example, the, Continental River, the Connecticut River textile towns of the early industrial area spawned new industries and products, armaments and tools and machines from Boston and Hartford and Springfield and Lowell, and some credit the North's victory in the Civil War to that newfound industrial capacity. The Monongahela River Valley uh, steel towns, including Pittsburgh, dominated for a time and created great companies and traditions. And they solidified the industrial era that then swept across the country. The Detroit complex of automotive manufacturing anchored what President Roosevelt referred to as the arsenal of democracy, and he credited it with a major reason for our winning World War II. My point is not that industries rise and fall and that regions ride with them that they give way to the next big idea. That is not my point. My point is that places, regions, and their leaders too often do not, when they're in their prime, look ahead and prepare the systems that would allow them to sustain that trajectory, that momentum, that arc of their prosperity. They do not recognize the essential dynamics and do not put in place the basic underpinnings which will enable them to adapt, to morph, to prepare for the next iteration to sustain prosperity. Too often, those of us in leadership don't stop to reflect on the basics of how metropolitan economies actually work. One basic component of how a region works involves where and how its people live. Sounds boring, not very interesting, where people live. But these places we call cities, 
regions, metros, exist to perform certain basic human functions. Cities are where people work. They're where people learn. They're where people assemble for social purposes, where they worship, where they govern themselves. But they must be places, first and foremost, where people can live. What do we mean by live? Well, I mean where they sleep, where they rest for the next day's work, where they raise their families, where they heal when they're sick, where they study, where they keep their valuable possessions, where they gather for the sacred events of everyday family life, where they live. The question I ask of you today is this. Is Silicon Valley fulfilling its function to be a place where people can live? I propose to you that your answer must consider six irrefutable inadequacies. Here, there is insufficient supply of housing, a truth. Here, there is insufficient new development of housing, a truth. Here, there is lack of resources being dedicated to the problem. Here, land restrictions make building new housing almost impossible. Here, political and public reluctance makes it difficult to build new housing. And finally, unaffordability for the workforce is a serious fact of life. I want to focus on solutions in my remarks today, but bear with me for a minute as we just spend a second on these points. First, insufficient supply. Russ Hancock has made the point well in his remarks this morning and in the slides. But Santa Clara County last year created 57,000 jobs, but only 9,000 new housing units. That's six times as many jobs as housing units. San Jose, 5.8 times as many jobs as housing units. Oakland, 9.7, and San Francisco, 9.2. Across the Bay, there is clearly a housing deficit, an insufficient supply. Secondly, an insufficient supply, uh, insufficient new development. We have CEQA permitting problems. There are increased construction costs. Last year, Santa Clara County produced only 27% of the additional affordable housing units needed. And this morning, there's a new report that suggests the vacancy rate is something as low as an almost unimaginable 0.2%. That means there's nothing available to rent. That's not even the friction that's involved in regular transactions. Thirdly, their lack of resources being dedicated to the problem. The demise of the local redevelopment agencies that the state cut out means that Santa Clara has $60 million less to put into housing and redevelopment functions. Federal funding has declined. So we have 40 to 60 percent declines in federal funding for housing being spent by local governments and the loss of inclusionary zoning authorities. Also, there are severe land restrictions. The increasing in cost of land itself, zoning restrictions, and then obsolete land uses that are being kept in those obsolete states. There are public and political reluctance to build. Public opposition in communities to increased density. I'll come back to that concept in a moment. And uh, opposition, obviously, concerns, fears of traffic. And finally, as I say, in terms of these realities, there is the reality of the unaffordability of housing for the workforce. A family in this county must earn $122,000 a year to afford the medium rent on a two-bedroom apartment. $122,000 to afford the median rent on a two-bedroom apartment. That's five times the minimum wage to afford asking rents. The Bay Area rate of increase of rents is 46% higher than the United States average. Well, what does this mean then in practical terms? Well, it means untenable housing environments for workers. They cannot house the necessary mix of workers that a city needs. You heard Russ in his comments earlier refer to the growth of wages for technical people, but also a great increase in the number of jobs for people who are the workforce. We've had experiences across the country in recent years of cities that broke down when 
uh, emergencies happened because they couldn't get the workers that were needed to do the, 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 lift, the heavy lifting kind of work. They lived too far away. Happened in Seattle a few years ago uh, after a great storm that knocked down where the trees knocked down power lines and they couldn't get the power workers in for days because unaffordability in the central city made people live at too great distances. People are doubling up. There's overcrowding to a ratio of 132% of the national average. More people living together, as he said, three generations deep. Traffic congestion, because workers can't live near where they work, therefore they must commute long distances, which is a negative for the worker, who has to pay more income for the transit cost, for the transportation cost, cost to the public for building those highways, and cost to the environment. Also, from a business standpoint, one of the implications of this reality is that productivity in the workplace suffers including turnover when people find it just too difficult. You heard Mr. Dawes earlier describe to his own family experience with recent college graduates making good money who were saying they need to move to another city. It just gets too expensive after a point. So turnover and then the necessary retraining that follows the turnover. Also, we know that there's increasing concern across the country about Silicon Valley lack of diversity. Controversial subject, but groups like Jesse Jackson's group and others are here talking about the lack of hiring among ethnic minorities, particularly African Americans and Latinos, in Silicon Valley's major industries. But it makes it more difficult for a diverse population to be able to live here when housing prices are what they are. These problems are interrelated. So this perpetuates, exacerbates Silicon Valley's in involvement in this national debate we're having right now about inequality. We end up with the housing haves and the housing have-nots. The housing haves are owners who can amass wealth in the value of their home, and the housing have-nots are renters who are burdened to the level of 30, even 50 percent of their total paycheck going just to keep a roof over their, house, over their head. Also, it means that more of people at the lower rungs will never be able to be homeowners. Mark my words, never be able to be homeowners in this environment. And we know that since the end of World War II, experts tell us, one of the rationales, one of the basic ladders by which people moved to the middle class was to have equity in a home. It's kind of an enforced savings that gives you the only thing that resembles net worth for most Americans, real worth, wealth is the equity that they have in their home. If we block that instrument of social progress out, home ownership, as is happening here, then we, 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 we've changed the very makeup of our society. And in its most dire manifestation, the housing crisis results in 6,500 homeless people every night here in Santa Clara County. So clearly there is work to be done. And I would say as a start, that work requires forethought and intentionality. My experience over the years as a mayor and traveling over to 200 different American cities as HUD secretary tells me that where there is not public will, intentionality, a conscious decision to deal with the problem, it won't be dealt with. This requires unity of action, a kind of collaboration that has characterized this region in the past. The spirit of collaboration that has made so much progress possible here needs to be applied to the housing sector. It requires advocacy, a focus on the human side of the problem. And thankfully, there are groups here, one, for example, called Silicon Valley at Home, that's focusing on trying to, to bring the voice of the people to the problem. It requires investment by the public sector, investment at a higher level by the public sector. That's a multiple-pronged problem because the public sector needs encouragement. It needs support. It needs courage. It needs to be shown that the business community is behind it, and then it can apply the resources when it has that level of support. And it requires an unprecedented level of public and private partnerships where corporations themselves, as many are now doing, are beginning to address the housing problem because it's a business issue. It's a business issue for them, and therefore corporate contributions and corporate involvement in solving it. So let's talk about some specifics. All right, need to build more supply. What does that mean? Well, the public sector 
can target sites and say, we're going to be, build housing in this part of our community. Here are sites. Here's public land that's available. We're going to put that into the mix, and we're going to build some housing in these settings. There are multiple communities across this valley that could do that. Again, forethought and intentionality. It also requires uh, uh, repurposing land uses. There's public land that's available that was once a salvage yard that's no longer needed, etc. Public land can be made available. And very importantly, uh, some, some land that's in the uh, transportation sector. The Valley Transportation Authority has surplus land in parking lots and other places like that that they're not using uh, any longer or, or, or in that way. Government surplus land and sites, outdated tech campuses, big box stores, retail uh, facilities, all kinds of things that are now obsolete and sitting there underutilized that other communities are finding make good sites for housing. In fact, my company has, in, in outside of Los Angeles, torn down a, a big lots a store and put in its place um, uh, uh, apartments and, and for sale housing. Employers themselves can sponsor housing near the sites of their workplaces, and some are beginning to do that. Where cities, let me make, remake my point, where cities want it to happen, where public authorities weigh in with the support of the private sector, it'll happen. My company, City View, works in building housing. I, I want to just share just a few experiences because they're relevant to this. We have worked in this area. Over in the East Bay, we've built in Berkeley and Union City. We built a, a, a project called Potrero Launch in China Basin in downtown San Francisco. All of these are workforce, firemen, policemen, teachers, nurses, tech workers, uh, governmental professionals, that level of worker. But we also have projects in Mountain View, Menlo Park, Foster City, and students out housing in San Jose. So I talked to one of my team members this morning and I said, as I meet with this group, you're the guy out on the front lines, acquiring the property, putting it together. What's the more, most important thing I can say? And he said, governments have to help. They have to break trail. If they don't, it takes two and three years and millions of dollars to get this done. It almost can't be done. If they do, some of the permitting process can be reduced to six months, and then you can actually make a project pencil out. The economics of it work. But it's all a question of whether or not the uh, again, in building supply, whether there is this kind of intentionality and will. A second set of initiatives involve more resources. We have to put additional money into the problem. So some of the advocate groups are, are talking about bond issues. That would be local ballot measures to actually put local resources in the form of debt into housing. My own hometown of San Antonio has never done a housing bond issue, but both the city of San Antonio and the county are talking now about a bond issue in 2017 for the first time for housing, and we think we can pass it on a major scale. And nonprofit groups are being brought into the mix, and, and, and the whole idea is add to the supply at the lower price ranges. Corporate involvement in such ballot measures will be very, very important. I strongly encourage you to go down that road. A third area of work involves what you've already heard about this morning, which is utilizing mass transit. And as the previous speaker, Stephen Heck, described, not just man tra mass transit, but the applications of technology and, and electric bicycles and all the rest of it. But the point is, as we bring BART, for example, into the South Bay and into the peninsula, it performs multiple functions. One is it eases the movement of people so People can get from work to where they live and the places where new housing is designated, and that reduces congestion. But also, transit sites are the perfect places to build housing, as we've seen all across America. And I know there's competition in thinking between Northern California and Southern California, but I've got to tell you, Los Angeles is doing some spectacular work in planning out their new transportation rail systems and building housing around the station nodes as well as in concentric circles around the stations where people can be close to the transportation. So they create walkable villages where people can live along the transit systems. Very important, I think, for all of the great progress 
of this peninsula, of this region, is far, far behind other places in the country on this score. Fourthly, it's important to educate the public about the bugaboo of density. People respond to density in negative ways. They think it means a lot more people, a lot more traffic. But it, they have to understand that it's the only way to get to affordable rents and prices with land prices being what they are. You have to build more dense, slightly smaller units, maybe a few stories higher. But urban design can get you a long way toward offsetting the difficulties of density, the ugliness of density, the parking garage, all of those things, uh, by making it compatible with open space, by designing it to be walkable and related to public amenities, by focusing on environmental sustainability. And in the final analysis, density promotes a sense of community as opposed to diminishes it. The critics who would oppose density basically end up arguing for the status quo, which means more sprawl, more traffic congestion, etc. Also, in the area of design, what we're seeing across the country is new models of housing are being considered. Accessory dwellings, which means putting some dwellings on the site of existing homes, once upon opposed by urban planners, but now understood where multiple generations want to live, where seniors want to live as they age, 78 million baby boomers moving into advanced years here in this, in this period. Co-housing, which means people living in new physical configurations, Senior housing of various kinds, huge, huge issue before the country. The first of the baby boomers turned 65 in 2011, 78 million people in the 18-year span. Boomers were born from 1946 to 1964, 78 million people becoming 65 in this period and, 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 and not being able to stay in that big, large house in the suburbs. Smaller housing, more affordable housing, more appropriately accessorized without the interior stairs, proper lighting, proper security, lower cabinets, uh, altered feature, uh, fixtures in the restrooms, etc. All of those things have to be thought of uh, as, as, as options in housing. Fifth, I would say, among these things to think about is to change the dialogue about housing, uh, to change the narrative and raise it to a larger perspective. This is bigger than just building. This is dealing with issues that are coming before us, like climate change. This is inter integrating these concerns with the public schools. All of these are the, the basic elements of how a metropolitan area works. And finally, in terms of these directions, if you will, towards solutions, is organizing for action. I congratulate Joint Venture Silicon Valley for putting the emphasis that it has on housing in this conference itself. What needs to follow from here are work groups, regional task forces that begin to prioritize concrete possible solutions to housing challenges. And then creating the governmental entities. Some have suggested joint powers authorities. I've spoken this morning about the, necessary, the necessity for bond issues at the county level and at the city level to give priority give priority, intentionality again, to the housing problem. Have to include advocate groups. I mentioned Silicon Valley at Home, headed by my friend who was the mayor of San Jose for many years, Ron Gonzalez. He's the chairman of the board, and Leslie uh, Corsiglia, who's executive director. And they have brought together Google and LinkedIn and Applied Materials, the Sobrato Foundation, the Knight Foundation, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, uh, the Packard Foundation, all of them already in the mix as advocates for housing. Very important to have the advocates and nonprofit builders. In my years at HUD, the single best nonprofit in the country is a group called Bridge. Best in the country, based right here in Northern California. State and national level pilot projects. If I were in your shoes, I'd be going to the state government and very importantly to Washington as a community, trying out ideas for pilot projects to get housing built. Create the circumstances locally and then go to the, to the, to the country and say, don't go to the nation and say, we need to build pilot projects in the Silicon Valley. Why would that work? 
because they care a lot about what you do here. This would be a model for the country in how we integrate the technology function, research and development, manufacturing, and creating livable places at the same time, not separating these functions, these ideas. My company uses as capital, uses for capital for our projects, um, a pension capital. We have investments from CalPERS, from Los Angeles City, Los Angeles County, M great retirement systems, public and private, universities, endowments, all have a portion of their investments in real estate. I was yes just yesterday in Illinois at Illinois Teachers. 15% of their total portfolio, which is billions of dollars, is for real estate. A portion of that is for residential. There's no reason in the world why the local pension systems in this valley and surrounding area couldn't dedicate resources to the housing problem right here in their backyard. Entirely doable and billions of dollars of capital can be unleashed. At least hundreds of millions of dollars of capital can be unleashed for, for housing. Um, and then part of this organizational process is the sophisticated targeting of a public awareness campaign to make it clear to the public, you know, density is not the problem. Smart integration of transportation can work. We can do this and we don't need to be afraid and we give our public officials the courage that they need to seriously address the housing problem. So let me close my remarks to you today with three kind of closing points. The first is that this is not a sidelight. One of the central messages I want to leave with you is this problem of housing is not a sidelight. It is not something that is, you know, kind of old school as compared to the new things that you do in your daily work. This is integrated. And the history of the country tells us when we don't integrate these ideas properly, then the region suffers. This is, a, this is a, a boom time for Silicon Valley. It ought not be a boom town that lasts just a decade or a few decades. It ought to last many, many decades. But to do that, the basics need to be taken care of as well. These things go together. People won't stay. People will leave. You won't get the best and the brightest. You'll have limits on what you can accomplish in terms of the numbers of people who come here and so forth. So it's, it really is business. It's not a sidelight. It's core business strategy for this region. Secondly, I would say, despite the complexity of these points, of these interwoven points, it is my experience that regions can be masters of their own destinies. They don't have to be just like so much driftwood tossed out on the stormy seas of economic change. They can say, we have a goal, we have a plan, we're going to work it and shape their destinies. I've seen it time and again all across the country, but there has to be, again, as I said earlier, intentional, unified, and investment-oriented responses. This can be done. And finally, my point is that these are big questions. These are long-term propositions. Uh, we saw pictures earlier of what Silicon Valley looked like in the 1940s. This is 2016. What's it going to look like in 2030, in 2050? You are stewards of a great national treasure, which is the technology sector, but you must also be stewards of the community that surrounds it and supports it in order for this to work long run. The nation has seen your creativity and your ability to collaborate. It is time to bring those attributes to sustain this national treasure and this global asset, which is the Silicon Valley. Thank you very much for allowing me to come over and be with you today.